Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm here to give you guys my review for Impact Wrestling Throwdown. This is pretty much the Thanksgiving special for Impact Wrestling, and I'm just going to go right through this. Um, this episode aired on November 26, 2019, and pretty much this was a parody show. I think they realized because it was Thanksgiving week, they realized they weren't going to, like, draw a big rating because a lot of people are going to be getting ready for Thanksgiving. I think it's a pretty lame excuse. Um, it was one thing when Impact was on Thursdays um, on Thanksgiving, so, you know, I gave them a little bit of pass that way, but this is Tuesday, like two days before Thanksgiving. And, yeah, I just don't really think that they should have done a show like this because, um... It's not like it was going to affect their ratings because it aired two days before Thanksgiving. And Impact just went to um, Access TV. And I don't think we should be seeing these type of shows like the first month of them being on Access TV. I think it was a terrible idea. Um, but pretty much this was pretty much uh, their version of uh, South Paul Regional Wrestling. They pretty much... Uh, made up this wrestling company that happened, and, uh, like, in 1983, and, um, all of the wrestlers that are typically signed to Impact Wrestling, uh, played different roles, and that was pretty much it. Now, the difference was with Cell Paul Regional Wrestling is it was new and original, like, when WWE did it, and they haven't, they never did a show for it. I kind of wish they had, but, uh, you know, it was actually fun and creative. This just wasn't, and I'm going to go through it and tell you why in a second. Um, but the promotion that they called themselves were Impact uh, Preventional Wrestling Federation. So pretty much, you know, as everybody knows, back in uh, 1983, it was still the territory days. Um, so, you know... Since they were in Canada for Impact Wrestling in real life, they just made it seem like that this was, um, you know, wherever they were in Canada's territory, so that's pretty much what happened here. Um, and what I'm going to do is, I'll review the show and then, uh, you know, say which wrestler played which uh, at the end. So, we had the commentary team of Sexton Hardcastle and, uh, Gillespie, uh, Chivoli Jr. Gillespie Chivoli Jr. Um, was like the son of the promoter, uh, Gillespie Sh uh, Chivoli. And Sexton Hodgecast, so he was a former, uh, professional wrestler. And, um, Sexton Hodgecast, so, um, you know, was like asleep, and then he wakes up, uh, cause, uh, Jespi Chivoli, uh, has to wake him up, and he has the microphone, because they, ha they had this set up as if it was in 1983 with the old mic stand and stuff like that, so we had to turn the microphone around, um, so it was pretty goofy. We had the introduction, it showed an introduction video package of, like, all of the wrestlers on the show, um, it had, like, the event announcer go through, um, who was, like, the commentators, the timekeepers and such, and it kicked right off with the match, it was, uh, Rip Razor versus Rapid Delivery Pete. Uh, this match was really nothing. It was really just filler. Really didn't care much for it. Uh, Rapid Delivery Pete's gimmick is that he's a um, he delivers Pete. He's a um, pizza deliver um, deliver deliver deliver. He, he's a pizza delivery guy. I was trying to think of the words, but I couldn't think of it. And he guess he delivers the pizzas rapidly and. Um, Rip Razor is a punk rock superstar, and, yeah, they have a match, uh, Rapid Delivery Pete asks if he wants, um, any pizza, I bet there was no pizza in the boxes, which is, like, why, and, um, you know, Rip Razor says he doesn't want any, and he is smoking a cigarette, and he goes to, uh, light it up. But Rapid Delivery Pete tells him that you can't be smoking, and he gets him into a, ch um, a headlock, but he was wearing a dog collar necklace, and uh, the points ended up hurting uh, Rapid Delivery Pete. Then, 
Um, yeah, they proceed to have a match. Rip Razor gets the advantage throughout much of it. He gets a wicked body slam on him, but then eventually rapid delivery Pete um, makes a comeback, and he hits the rapid delivery splash for the win. It's pretty, pretty bland. I give it two stars. Really nothing special. Then... Iceman interviews Julian uh, Cumberbun and uh, Sonny Sanders. Uh, Julia, Julian Cumberbun is going to defend his um, International Commonwealth Television Championship um, on this show in a Loser Leaves Town match against uh, Downtown Daddy Brown. So he cuts a promo, and Sonny Sanders pretty much talks about how uh, they pretty much make fun of downtown Danny Brown, and they say that, uh, or Daddy Brown, and they say that after they win, they're going to go out for cheeseburgers with pickles, and, um, Julian Cumberbund basically says, without, um, me, this town doesn't exist. Uh, downtown Daddy Brown comes out and, uh, says, uh, that he's pretty much going to beat him. He says this awful line where he says, um, I'm going to take you uptown, and I'm going to stay downtown. It was sounded so scripted. And then Sonny Sanders, who is basically a parody of Jim Cornette. I get this was taped before that situation happened in NWA, but I don't think it was a good idea to air this. Um, and then Julian Cumberbund was pretty much like a rich guy. Um, and, yeah, um, Sonny Sanders says we can do this later. He goes to walk away, and he hits downtown Daddy Brown with a tennis racket, and uh, they... Try to attack him, but downtown Daddy Brown uh, fights him off, and he rips uh, Julian Cumberbund's suit off. It was really not all that good. Then we had a vignette for the hard workers who were going to have a match. Um, and then Iceman um, interviews Excessive Force, and pretty much they are sick and tired of the hard workers having shoes and stuff, and while they're struggling to make ends meet, so that was whatever. Um, and... Afterwards, we had Excessive Force versus the Hard Workers. Excessive Force get the heat on one of the Hard Workers, and then the other one comes in and beats him with a wall-up. Um, and then the um, Excessive Force just beat the crap out of, him, out of him afterwards. It was whatever. It was, uh, two, it was uh, not that good match. It was one and a half stars. Then we have a vignette for the surfers. Uh, pretty much the over-the-top surfers where they just say bro and stuff like that. It was pretty bad. Then we had uh, Johnny Swinner versus Buck um, Gunderson. This was the exact same match that aired on Impact um, in real life um, a week before this. So uh, it made no sense for them to do this uh, because fans are going to know that this is bullshit. Um, but they did it anyways. Um, and Johnny Swinner wins with the Swinner Neckbreaker. Um, and then Gillespie and Hardcast will try to pretend like, you know, instant replay has never been a thing since this is technically 1983, and it really doesn't make any sense, because instant replays have been a, lo a thing longer than 1983. Uh, then we had a vignette for Frank the Bookster saying that he's going to cut down all the competition. Then I Iceman interviews the Rough Riders, um... And they all pretty much challenge anybody to fight them, but they don't think anybody will accept the challenge. Uh, but obviously, they were mistaken. Then it showed ad for uh, IPWF live events. Then we had um, Jazzy Fitbody versus Angus uh, Biohote, who I think was just a local enhancement talent. Um, and um, during uh, the match... Sebastian Baker, who is like a scam artist, um, and like a manager, tries to, it has been trying to like sign her, um, under his like legal representation for months, and, um, he comes out, and, um, he's distracting her, but it doesn't work, she ends up winning with a splash, which made no sense, because, um, it didn't really look like that impactful of a move just because Jazzy Fitz's body um, doesn't have, like, the physique to put someone away with a splash. It didn't really make any sense. Um, and, yeah, she wins, and then, um, 
Sebastian Baker comes in and wants her to sign the contract, and she does. Um, and um, eventually, though, she just low blows him, but puts the contract up and leaves, so she denies. This makes no sense, though, because they told us that the storyline had been going on for months, but... It's a parody show, so they can't blow off and do anything with it. So it just, I don't know. Uh, Congo Khan's backstage, and basically he challenges anyone to come body slam him for $300,000. Big whoop de doo Then we had an eight-man, well, an eight-person in a gentle tag team match. It was uh, Timber, Gymnasium, Bill Din, and Race Strack. Those are the Rough Riders. Man, this match here. Um... The Rough Riders win when, um, when, um, Blanche Aldmore, um, hits a splash from the top rope, I believe, on the gymnasium, but I could have cared less about any of this. Uh, this match was two shows. It was getting good, and then it ended. And this is supposed to be in, like, 1983. They were doing a lot of, like, indie-style moves that you would see in 2019. That made no sense. Then it recaps the Body Slam Challenge where somebody failed. We had the Body Slam Challenge. Um, Mr. Atlantis tries to come out, but he fails. And then Muscles McGee comes out and attacks him and ends up Body Slamming him. Whatever. Um, Tommy Dreamer does a promo, and he's upset that he had to give up the IPWF heavyweight title. Um, and... Um, he just basically cuts a fiery promo on, like, basically everyone. The Fex, uh, no, sorry, the Funks, uh, Tully Blanchard, Vince McMahon Sr., and says that he's going to slap the crap out of Vince McMahon Jr. Um, he cuts a promo on, um, yeah, basically everybody. It's great. Actually, this was the highlight of the show. We had a recap from last week. It showed, um, it, um, Showed a match between um, DJ Too Large and uh, Captain Joystick. And Captain Joystick was accompanied by Miss Mile High. And uh, DJ Too Large won, I guess. I don't know. They did do a spot where, like, um, Captain Joystick tried to do the um, spot where he takes the chair and pretends, like, uh, you know, smashes it and throws it. At DJ Too Large. And uh, he falls down. And uh, the referee catches him. Which makes no sense. Because how could this. If this is supposed to be in 1983. Eddie Guerrero didn't do this really. Until like 2003. So how does that even work? Um, this is why I couldn't get into this. It's so illogical. Um, I mean even. Eddie Guerrero didn't do this stuff. Until like the 2000s. So he, what the hell. Um, then they do like a, and obviously too, um, they still have to find a way to get the dick spot in with, uh, DJ Two Loads hitting a chop right to his crotch and, uh, it ends up hurting him. So, it's all bad. And they do like a, um, a cockpit segment with DJ Two Loads and, uh, it was all bad. I don't really care enough to talk about it. I'm skipping right over that. I recap something from a month ago where um, Cowboy Colt McCoy apparently got taken out um, by Gama Sin by getting a fireball thrown in his face, and he was out for like three weeks. He was out for like a month, and it leads to a blindfold match between Gama Sin and Cowboy Colt McCoy. Ga uh, Gama Sin was accompanied by uh, Dadison, and uh, yeah, it's a blindfold match. Um, I don't really like blindfold matches, you know, it's basically, uh, no one really does anything, they try to find their opponent, and, yeah, it's just all boring, and Cowboy Colt McCoy won with a twist of fate, but they don't call it that, because technically that move doesn't exist, so they call it a twist and ace crusher, uh, which makes no sense, because that really move hasn't really been said until all elite wrestling, so, get out of here, this match was minus three shows, um, afterwards, the Soviets, um, you know, because they had a Soviet gimmick because uh, of the Soviet Union, which uh, I don't think 
professional wrestling would have taken a risk and done that. I mean, they did do it with Sal Slaughter with the Iraq gimmick, but um, I don't. I think the Soviet Union they wouldn't have really touched that um, in the way that they did, and they attack Cowboy Cole McCoy, and then Pops, who's uh, Gillespie Chavelle's father and the owner of IPWF tries to come out and stop it, but they beat him up too, and then they put the Soviet Union flag on uh, Cowboy. Um, uh, yeah, they put the Soviet Union flag on Cowboy uh, Colt McCoy. And then afterwards, uh, Pops does like a promo saying, you know, that he built this company from nothing, and um, I may not be medically clear, but I'm going to return to the wind next week and have a, and have a team up with uh, Cowboy Colt McCoy to face the Soviet Union. I don't know why they would do something like this, because they can't even deliver on the match. Then we had the main event. It was a uh, Loser Leaves Town match for the International Commonwealth Television Championship. Um, International uh, Commonwealth Television Champion Julian Cumberbun with uh, Sony Sanders Winside versus Downtown Daddy Brown. Um... Downtown Daddy Brown gets the advantage throughout much of this match, and then eventually uh, Sonny Sanders gets involved. They did do a funny spot, which I thought was my favorite thing of the show, actually, where Julian Cumberbund tried to pretend to be a fan at ringside to hide from da uh, Downtown Daddy Brown, and Downtown Daddy Brown catches him. That was great. But it's basically every match you've ever seen where the manager keeps getting involved, and Downtown Daddy Brown overcomes the odds and wins with a roll-up. And afterwards, all basically the baby faces come out and celebrate with uh, Dad Town Daddy Brown after he's won the championship. And Ju uh, Julian Cumberbun, it has to leave town pretty much. And I guess I don't think Sonny Sanders does because um, he's only managing him. But whatever. Uh, the match wasn't anything special. I gave it uh, two and a quarter stars. Um, that's basically the show. I'll go through everyone who uh, was a part of the show and who they played. Um, Ethan Page played uh, Julian Cumberbund, the International Commonwealth Television Champion. Uh, Willie Mack played Downtown Daddy Brown. Sammy Callahan played Sonny Sanders. Eddie Edwards played uh, Cowboy Colt McCoy. Uh, Raj Shin played Donison. Trey played Bilden. Uh, who was a builder, obviously. Uh, Des played uh, Gymnasium, who was a gym teacher, obviously. Uh, Josh Alexander played Tim Burr, who was a lumberjack, obviously. Uh, Wentz played uh, Ray Track, who was a race car driver, obviously. Tessa Blanchard played Blanche Ardmore, so you can see what they did there. Alexa Nicole played Mildred Moore. Jordan Grace played uh, Georgie, um, Georgia Cobb. Jessica Havoc played Lady Bird Johnson, so you can see what they did there. Um, Ace Austin played uh, Whip Razor, who was a punk. Witch Swan played Rapid Delivery Pete, who was a pizza delivery guy. D'Lo Brown, uh, Brown and Fala Blah both played uh, Pumble and Plunder, um, who made up Excessive Force. The Deaners played Oats and Hale, who, played, who made up the Hard Workers. Madison Wayne played Jazzy uh, Fitzbody, who's a fitness instructor. Joey Ryan played Captain Joystick, obviously. You can tell by that who's a pilot, but you can obviously tell why they did Captain Joystick if you know Joey Ryan's gimmick. Carrie Hogan played Miss Mile High Stewardess. Uh, Moose played DJ Tulo, who was a rap star. Don Callis played uh, Sexton Hardcastle, who was, a who was a retired legendary wrestler. Josh Matthews played G G G Just Be uh, Sof Schofield, or however you say his name, an entitled son of the boss. Rhino played Frank the Butcher. Jimmy Jacobs played Sebastian Baker, a scam artist. Uh, Brian Cage played Muscle McGee, a Canadian hero. Uh, Michael Elgin and Madman Fulton played the Soviets. And uh, Scott Demore played Pops, Just Be uh, Jaspi Shavoli's father and owner of IPWF. And, yeah, that was basically pretty much uh, what this show was. Uh, not entertained by this show at all. Um, 
I get it was a holiday so so you can't really take this too silly, but I didn't really find any of this really funny. These gimmicks that they came up with were like gimmicks that you would have expected Vince McMahon Jr. to come up with uh, in the early like 90s of professional wrestling. Just these cringy gimmicks that we've seen. And that's exactly the vibe I got from, uh, you know, watching the show. Like, you know, Timbo, um, Pizza Delivery Pete. It was just all terrible. Um, and not something that they should be doing when they're on Access TV now. So, this episode was lame. Um... And I'm going to give this episode an F, and I'm going to give it, like, um, like a 3 out of 100. I really didn't enjoy this at all. Um, so that's pretty much it, guys. Uh, thank you guys for watching this video. Leave your thoughts on what you thought of this show in the comments. And uh, I think I'm going to take a bit of a break from watching wrestling uh, for, like, the rest of the day. Just because this show just drained me so much. Uh, but that's pretty much it, guys. Please make sure you guys like, comment, and share this video so people will watch it. Make sure you guys subscribe to this channel for more content and click on the bell. So that way, every time I upload a video, you guys get the notifications for it. And make sure you guys do the same thing for my CM Brothers and everyone on the Talkinator YouTube channels. And that's pretty much it, guys. Talk to you later.